Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming back. Take your seats. So slightly fewer people in here uh, at the moment. We're also um, streaming this session into the Godfrey Mitchell room ahead of the Innovation Showcase at 2 o'clock. So hopefully, if you are downstairs, uh, that you're able to, to listen in and uh, hear what we're saying and see what we're doing. Um, so for this afternoon, we're going to start actually with uh, some remarks from uh, Ian Williams, the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Natural Environmental Research Council. So please come up, Ian. Um, we're obviously delighted at CGFI to have funding from UKRI and particularly uh, NERC. Um, so really looking forward to Ian's remarks. And then we're gonna go straight over then to, to another Ian. Uh, to Professor Ian Clasher, who leads our work uh, at Leeds, to go into a, a fireside chat. And I'll let you, Ian, talk a little bit more and set the context for that. Uh, and that'll take us up to about two o'clock. Uh, and then in here, we'll move to the tipping points panel with the innovation showcase happening downstairs. So thanks so much. And Ian, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Good to see everybody uh, again this year. Uh, great to see uh, such a large number of people uh, interested in this very important subject. Um, oh, hang on a minute. This looks slightly different slide set than, than I was expecting, but that's okay. It'll keep me on my toes. Um, <laughs> uh, so as, as part of... Uh, as, part of NERC, uh, Natural Environment Research Council, which is part of uh, UKRI. Uh, we, we're obviously uh, interested in uh, researching the environment, understanding the environment, and getting, uh, getting the information about the environment to, into the hands of those people who need it, those people who can use it for decision-making processes. And as part of that, uh, we have a number of cross-cutting themes uh, across UKRI uh, one of which is building a green future, which is very much part of how we uh, meet net zero uh, in 2050. Um, I'm going to talk uh, roughly about, uh, uh, about three things uh, this afternoon. Uh, firstly, I'll mention a few things about our green finance portfolio, uh, which, is, which you can see here, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I then talk about data, and I understand you were talking uh, about data this morning. Uh, not only about the data we have, but again, much more importantly, about how we can use the data, how we can create new data that is relevant, uh, relevant for users, relevant uh, for decision making. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about a new infrastructure we'll be developing over the next few years as well, which is relevant uh, in this field. So over, uh, over the last few years, we've been growing at NERC our green finance portfolio. Um, uh, obviously, the, uh, the CERAF program uh, supporting uh, CGFI uh, um, on, on, the, uh, on the left of the slide, uh, but also growing this portfolio into more biodiversity considerations uh, through the economics of biodiversity research program and the Integrating Biodiversity into Finance or, or Building a Nature Positive Future program as well. And we let uh, new programs, new parts of this program uh, earlier this year. And, and slightly separately, uh, the Renew program led by the University of Exeter, looking again at biodiversity uh, through a people-centered approach, if you like. And with the exception of the Renew program, uh, what you can see at the bottom of each of the, uh, the four boxes there, uh, not only the, the, the NERC logo, uh, Natural Environment Research Council logo, but also the logos of other research councils as part of UKRI. And it uh, shows that this work is very much done in collaboration with our colleagues at Innovate UK, the Economic and Social Research Sciences uh, Research Council, and the Renew programme, which is only funded by NERC, but is part of our portfolio that specifically is looking at uh, interdisciplinary work and therefore recognizing that this work is not going to, going to be delivered by environmental scientists, but we need to engage the, the whole of the research community, the whole of, uh, the whole of institutes, if you like, in order to del deliver some of these environmental solutions that are important uh, to help us get to net zero by 2050. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here and just uh, talk on uh, 
some of the successes of uh, of the programme that uh, that, uh, that have been. Uh, uh, that's been delivered over the past few years, thanks to many of the people in this room. Uh, there's a couple here that uh, I'll touch on, but uh, earlier this year in, in the autumn, uh, CGFI launched the Leeds Innovation Hub. You may be hearing about that in, in a moment, uh, which expanding the programme. Um, the, 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 pro, the programme, uh, the Renew programme based at Exeter, did a very uh, interesting piece of work called The Nature of Business, looking at how different businesses use, consider, and value biodiversity in their considerations, a really interesting report. And as I'll come on to talk in a moment, uh, really great to see the Resilient uh, Planet Data Hub being, being launched recently. And again, the importance of getting data in the right place at the right time to the right people. So moving on a little bit to some of our digital programs, um, just highlighting a couple of these. NERC has over 30 petabytes of data uh, in, in its environmental data service. Huge amounts of data, often uh, occasionally described as some of the crown jewels of, uh, of NERC's portfolio. But, as we said, this data is only useful uh, if it is uh, accessible, available, and interoperable with, with the right, uh, with other sorts of data, because environmental data in and of its own is, is limited to how it can help. So we developed the uh, Digital Solutions Programme based at the University of Manchester uh, a couple of years ago to do just that, to enable uh, a, a greater use, e facilitating use and ease of accessibility to, to our data and making it interoperable, particularly in an example as using it with health data sets as well, which can be particularly challenging with, uh, with the openness of data uh, and security of data between those two environments. But Test, really testing how we can make sure that data are interoperable and use, users go around a whole range of different, different uses. Moving across to the right of, of the diagram there, um, we all talk about um, uh, uh, AI and using AI uh, a, a lot. I'm an ecologist by background. I spent a lot of my early career looking down microscopes, identifying insects. I enjoyed that part of my life greatly. But it wasn't the most efficient use of my time, and certainly now if you look at the tools available to us now, um, using automated image analysis to do that kind of work uh, is so much more efficient, and I hate to say it's probably more accurate than, than my own identification skills as well. Moving uh, around the circle, uh, d using digital twins to understand our, how the environment is changing in real time and how we can predict that. I'll give an example of that in a moment. And finally, innovation in environmental monitoring, how we can create new data that is available at the right time for decision makers. So just to highlight a couple of examples uh, uh, from that, um, uh, the, the Pay Diver uh, program on the, on the left-hand side of the side, that's a program led by National Oceanography Centre uh, down in Southampton, using, uh, using image analysis, looking at whole ecosystems and habitats and, as, and being able to assess their quality remotely uh, through, uh, through remote imagery. Moving into the middle, the SPLASH program led by the uh, University of Plymouth is, is looking at digital twins using tide gauges, using uh, peak wave heights, uh, past data and live data to uh, look at overtopping of flood defences. A really good example of, of a digital twin approach. And finally, and very topically, of course, in, uh, in freshwater ecosystems, using new types of technologies that can provide real-time data uh, on the chemical status of fresh water. This is a program led by University of Southampton. And again, how we can get real-time data into the hands of decision makers at the right spatial scale, it might be at specific locations, uh, or might be at a larger spatial scales. And these programs are looking at different approaches to using, if you like, the very latest technologies, very latest innovations to help that. And they're all very much designed with the data at the forefront. Which leads me to uh, probably the final uh, part uh, of the talk here, which is our, our latest uh, infrastructure that we'll be developing. This uh, is based on flood and drought research. Uh, we all know in this room the uh, economic consequences of major, uh, major flood incidences and drought incidences. 
uh, over time. And we all know that, uh, that winters are predicted to be warmer and wetter and summers drier. So hydrological extremes in the UK we will be experiencing more in the future. So we just launched a program, uh, a, a 35, £38 million pound investment uh, in partnership with the uh, UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology to develop uh, a new infrastructure that will enable researchers to use uh, uh, monitoring systems across three different catchment areas in, catchments uh, in the UK, one in the Thames, one in the Tweed uh, in Scotland and the Severn. Uh, to, to really advance uh, our understanding of how water moves through the environment uh, and how we can therefore manage those hydrological extremes better, better predict them, better understand when they, where they might happen at better spatial scales and, where, and how we can manage them better. Uh, it's a project like I said, led by UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology uh, with colleagues from the University of Bristol and British Geological Survey and Imperial College as well. So really exciting programme. As I said, it, it is not yet started uh, and, and will begin, uh, will begin in, in, in the coming months to be built and should be fully online uh, over the next few years. So this sort of, I, I will raise that. Which leaves me finally uh, to, to highlight uh, a session later this afternoon where some of the folk who I've mentioned who are involved in some of the programs that I've talked about uh, will be around taking part in, in the discussions. So uh, at, uh, I think it's 3.30 uh, in the Godfrey Mitchell Theatre. Please do uh, join them for, for more details uh, and to have a chat about some of the things I've, I've introduced to you uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. I think I hand straight up. Thank you for that, Ian. It's really nice to see all that work up there. It's really, it's really impressive when you see the scale of it. Um, so we've got a 15-minute fireside chat, which is barely time to get the fire warm. So in terms of trying to get through this, what we thought might be more interesting is a sort of brief discussion on the panel, but really opening it up to a lot of questions from the floor. post lunch time, it would be good to try and make sure everybody's fully engaged for the next session as well. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Adrian Barnes, who is Head of uh, Green Analytics at Macquarie, and Perinda Thind, who is a Finance Nature Lead at Climate Champions. Um, so I think the first question really from me, Mr. to both of you, is can you tell us a bit about your current role and sort of how you emerged into that as a kind of career path and a bit about your background? So Perinda? Sounds good. Pleasure to be with all of you here today. Thanks so much for having me. Um, in terms of my current role, I'm currently the Finance Nature Lead with the Climate Champions team. And the Climate Champions team, uh, we serve the UN high-level climate champions, which have the mandate under the Paris Agreement to connect the work of non-state actors, businesses, financial institutions, cities and regions, um, alongside the work of the parties to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. And um, the role of Nature Finance portfolio is really to see how we can align the finance sector uh, to meet our nature positive goals alongside net zero goals within this multi-governance uh, environmental system that we have. Um, with regards to how I transitioned into this role, I started off my career in sustainable investing in the commercial real estate investment sector and uh, really worked within that financial institution to understand how investment ma managers you know, understand climate-related risks and opportunities and how do we really translate ESG strategy across the business. And then I moved into consulting with uh, financial institutions, mostly commercial banks and uh, institutional investors on developing net zero strategies and uh, starting to incorporate nature-related risks and opportunities. So as this finance nature space is quite nascent, um, a lot of different organizations are obviously coming into this space. Um, so it's a really interesting, exciting moment to, to, to focus on this portfolio. Um, but a lot of challenges ahead as well, given uh, this year we have opportunities on, at the same time with the three Rio conventions, the CBD COP16, COP29, which is the finance COP, and then the UNCCD, which is the land desertification COP as well. So nature and finance is cross-cutting across the three, uh, but we're also, as everyone's aware, working in a very uh, tenuous uh, 
political environment. Uh, so it's uh, a challenge, but an opportunity to be working on this portfolio at the same time. Fantastic. Eugene? Great, thanks Ian. Um, hi everyone, so um, I work in Macquarie Asset Management, which is the, the world's largest um, in, uh, international, so the world's largest infrastructure investor um, and asset manager. Um, and my role is, I guess, first and foremost, so we're part of, as, as, as part of sustainability, we have a broad remit to, um, to, to, to manage environmental, social governance, um, risk, risks, evaluation, opportunity management, uh, and, and disclosure. Um, but more specifically, I focus on the green investments business. Um, I came into that, well, I, I suppose in terms of my, my sort of career journey, I started off uh, in environmental science, not, not quite looking down microscopes like, like Ian did, but um, stomping around roadsides looking for a great crested news, that sort of thing. Um, so, so then HELP was, was part of the team that helped set up the UK Green Investment Bank. Um, and, uh, and, and as, as many of you know, that, um, that came with a specific, uh, a specific mandate to, to make investments um, into, into green technologies and, and, and infrastructure. Um, that was then privatized, we were acquired by Macquarie in 2017, um, and then uh, and, and spent five years kind of investing Macquarie's uh, balance sheet capital. Uh, and then two years ago, moved across into Macquarie Asset Management. Uh, and so now we have a, a fiduciary role there. We're, we're obviously managing capital on behalf of other investors. But actually, a lot of the lessons from, from the UK Green Investment Bank when we were trying to responsibly manage the British taxpayers' uh, uh, investment in, uh, in, in that institution and also disclose to them about what we were doing with their money, they, they hold equally true in a, in a private capital um, asset management environment. No, thank you. That's really interesting as well. I hate it. I just do pension stuff and I meet all these really smart people when I come to CGFI. It's terrible. Um, so, I think a couple of questions from me. So, how do you get robustness into decision making? Because a lot of this is CGFI is data and analytics. And there are, as we've heard in all the other sessions, lots of data, lots of analytics, lots of tools. So how do you actually get robustness into decision making? It's a really good question. And I'll speak to this question um, with two different sets of experiences. One is you know, previously working within a financial institution and really looking at the climate-related data at hand. Uh, when I was uh, working at the global commercial real estate investment firm, uh, we were one of the uh, pilot uh, piloting T uh, TCFD uh, when it was uh, you know first launched in 2017, 2018. And at that point, really starting to understand what is the data at hand in terms of data availability. And that was a key issue at that point in terms of what is available, is it robust, um, and how can we ensure um, we're using, all organizations are using a single source of, of data. Um, and being part of uh, the UNEPFI real estate uh, pilot uh, group around TCFD was quite useful because then you're able to share knowledge and lessons learned. At the same time, we also figured that when you're translating this information to investment managers who at the end of the day are the ones making the investment decisions uh, from an acquisition perspective and an operations perspective, uh, there really needs to be a translation role between what is the climate value at risk and what does that mean for the investment decision at hand? Um, and how do we bring together the realities of the investment decisions with the climate related information and that translation work I think really feeds into how the robustness of the information and how it is and could be decision useful. Uh, so I think there are lessons to be learned from understanding the investment managers perspectives and the business realities and how we marry that with the, with, with the climate related information at hand. The other aspect of it as we, in my current role of nature finance uh, portfolio and kind of looking at it from engagement with private sector more broadly, uh, as we look towards you know, encouraging investments in nature-based solutions, uh, a key element of that is also then ensuring uh, robustness in terms of um, alignment with 
key standards out there because you can't use uh, you know investments in nature-based solutions as cover for continuing to um, you know steer away from meeting net zero commitments. It's a both and approach. So I think uh, kind of taking a step back, talking about robustness and data, um, making sure that you're looking at climate and nature-related efforts uh, in tandem. And that is new for many different organizations. Um, so I think there's value in ensuring, A, you're following robust standards when it comes to net zero commitments. And then also, um, as the nature finance space emerges, how are we ensuring integrity on that side as well to ensure robustness of, of data and, uh, and there's value in ensuring that uh, you, know, you have open source uh, neutral platforms as well uh, when we talk about uh, robustness of data and meeting net zero and nature positive goals um, simultaneously. Adrian? Yeah, I definitely echo Peninda's point on, on the translation, um, giving, the, giving the investment decision makers the information that they need and condensing that. I suppose with that comes an inevitable requirement for, for skills and, and, and expertise. Um, data, I, I think it was mentioned in one of the previous panels, data without the ability to interpret it is, is, is completely meaningless. So you need that, uh, that, that fundamental underlying technical ability to understand what it is you're looking at it, what it is that you're looking at, uh, but, but also the experience of the investment landscape to see what does that, what does that mean for, for your investment. Um, and uh, I, I guess, you know, the, the good news there for, for people in this room is that their jobs aren't first in line to be taken over by AI um, because there will always be a role for, for, for qualitative evaluation. My, my job title is head of, of green analytics, but it, it, it might as well be analysis as well. Um, the, the, it, it's, it's going to be, be a while before someone invents, invents an, an algorithm that can be interpreted by AI that equates our, our valuation of a ton of greenhouse gas emissions to our valuation of uh, one hectare of a specific area of biodiversity habitat, just because that's not even capable of, you, you can't even do that at the theoretical level, never mind trying to apply that. But real world decision, real world investment decisions have to understand the relative value of those things in the context of, of you know, our economy and broader senses of, of community values. So um, th th those, those, you might call them soft skills, but those skills in being able to set context and, and evaluate things qualitatively are, are just as important as data analysis. Thank you. So I'm going to open up to questions from the floor, if there's any. Oh, we have somebody up the back, but nobody doing microphones. Uh, all right. Thank you. It's just the chap in the red shirt at the back, put his hand up. Andy Barry, um, University of Oxford. Um, this is a question really to Adrian. Um, Macquarie have a bit of a bad record <laughs> in terms of Timber Water and the high, the high debt load that they, they left um, Timber Water in. I mean, how do you reconcile that with what you're, what you're saying? With, I mean, what do you have any reflection? So I did catch the second part of the question. So. Macquarie left uh, Thames Water with a high debt load when they sold their investment a few years ago. Um, they, that has resulted in a, a um, they can't invest in, in sewage, basically sewage, sewage out there into the Thames. Um, how do you reconcile that? I mean, do you have any reflections on that? I mean, in terms of... Um, I, I can't really offer any, any insights on, on Thames Water that, that you know, be, being an asset that, that was, was, was divested um, in 2017, and um, it, it, it's not one that, that I've had any engagement with. You know, very happy to put you in contact with um, colleagues in Macquarie Asset Management who, who were involved in the, uh, the oversight of that asset. Um, I mean, I suppose any, any reflections in a broad sense, it certainly heightens the importance of social license to operate. Um, it's, it's of no surprise to anyone that when the, when the uh, Green Investment Bank privatisation was being considered that um, Macquarie's, uh, Macquarie's ability to own that, and own that institution and, and carry forward its mission responsibly was, was closely scrutinised. Um, 
the government set in place governance arrangements and independent board of trustees that, that, that we have to report to and, and comment on our activities every year. And you know, certainly as, as far as the continuation, continuance of that green mission and our commitment to, to, to continuing that mission and, and furthering new types of, of green investment, um, you know, I'm very, I'm very confident to say that uh, that uh, that we've done a responsible job of of promoting green investment. I'm sorry. So, uh, just yeah, I'm, I'm, just I'm not sure I can offer a, a, a great deal more in terms of the, the specifics on Thames Water, but um, you know, happy to provide information separately if you if you wish. Yeah, just in the, just for time and expedience, if we could. Is that, I'm really sorry. There's, a, there's now a question right down the front from Mike, which is really stressing me because I'm worried he's going to direct it at me. Do my best. Uh, so, Mike Clark, I come to lots of these events and we hear about all the good work going on, but I think we don't, this is not just a UK comment, we don't really accelerate policy. So, I think my question is, and I'd love you to join in here, I think my question is how do we, in academia and related fields, how do we increase the advocacy? How do we say we've actually got a problem? Finance can do so much. I think GFANS needs to advocate upwards as well as do papers. How do we get the advocacy into this? I mean, I do worry we're going to have a sort of five, ten year nature chat fest. Very little capital flow, some capital will flow. But then, you know, the emissions may sort of get us. So how do we find a way in a sort of systems thinking way to get people who, you know, academics are often naturally quite cautious, you know, I'll know more next year. How do we get the sort of the advocacy, the urgency? Because in one sense, we've got a COVID slow burning situation. How do we, how do we in this room accelerate the advocacy? So, and feel free to join in. I'll try. Um, a 15 second answer on an incredibly difficult question. I, I can. Take a, take a crack at that. I think the policy, as you said, shifting the policy environment and ensuring that we have the right enabling conditions to accelerate and redirect investments in, in areas that we, uh, that we want towards climate and, and nature goals is, is quite important. You know, Paris Agreement Article 2.1c, or you can get nerdy here, you know, talks about alignment with, uh, of, the, of the financial system with the, the goals of the Paris Agreement and climate resilient development, as does the global biodiversity framework that all parties have agreed, or most parties have agreed, agreed to, um, talks about alignment of financial system, a private and public, with the, the goals of the global biodiversity framework. And so, to your point, you know, private financial institutions and, and public financial institutions play a key role in, in, in terms of aligning their advocacy efforts with their net zero commitments as, as they're making it. That can hopefully accelerate, as you're saying, this ambition loop uh, that we hear so that their lobbying practices and advocacy uh, positions are aligned with what they've publicly committed to, which, which are their net zero commitments. And then can we ensure as well um, efforts around um, knowledge sharing within within the um, within the private sector as well um, to, to enable this. Um, I know we have uh, only brief brief time, so I'll pause there. But I, I think this is really the the next moment uh, and momentum that we need to build around policy environment policy uh, enabling environment to ensure that uh, the organisations themselves are operating in a way that um, that allows them to meet the the goals that we've agreed to. Um. Yeah, and I suppose in terms of what can the what can what can the scientific community do, what what can the academic research community do, um, tell policymakers look, look very closely, look very analytically at, at, at what's worked um, and what hasn't worked in the past. Um, the the UK has has got a pretty good record of, of mainstreaming investment into into climate mitigation finance, certainly in the energy sector. Other hard to abate sectors. Um, you know, agriculture, aviation that, that have been mentioned previously, uh, w w 
what similar interventions could be replicated there and, and to other environmental sustainability challenges, the circular economy, climate adaptation, biodiversity protection. We can, we can look at policy instruments that have been effective in the past, um, especially ones that have succeeded in not just offering concessional capital or finding ways to, to, to deploy, the, finding ways to, to spend taxpayers' money, but actually leveraging the huge amount of capital that exists in, in, the, public, in, the, in the private sector to, to, to deliver those solutions. So, just to make you happy, Mike, um, it would be nice if we could get some stability in policy because actually the chopping and changing by successive governments through time, so we're not talking about just recently, creates an environment of uncertainty. So actually from a private sector side, it becomes incredibly difficult to decide to commit capital in that way, when next year, what you thought was a good idea is now a bad idea. So that stability is really important. Um, so just before we finish up, two very quick ones from me. I'm stealing one more minute of your time um, before we thank the panelists as well. So, I'm also in charge of the innovation hub in CGFI has in Leeds. So, I just wanted to draw your attention to two projects, if that's okay. The first is a new collaboration with the insurance industry. So, we're going to be working with MS Amlin, AXA, XL, and Maximum Info to look at sort of risk and uncertainty and how we could look at the insurance sector as a, as a kind of um, early warning system for significant changes in the climate in different parts of the world. Also, Tom and Chris and Maximum Info, they've got a demo in the, the other room, there's tea and coffee, very much worth having a look at. It's got a model by Ralph Toomey currently plugged into it uh, called Iris. The other thing is we've got an asset owner group and a risk modeler, which we're now starting to road test. So if you're an asset owner and you want to have a look at it and start to give us feedback, Trish here is the Innovation Hub Manager. She's sitting down the front and being very shy, but if you want to get involved, please do. So talk to Trish and we'll, we'll, we'll look be into all that discussion. And the last thing is, is just to thank the panelists. So thank you very much. <laughs>